All right, well, we are going to talk tonight in the book of Hebrews. And the title is going to be a little lower than the angels. But we're going to do a short review before then on last week's lesson. Last week's lesson in the first four verses of chapter 2 was entitled, There's a Way to Heaven, We Must Not Neglect It. So let's look at uh, last week, verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. So, again, to set that up from chapter 1, verse 1 of chapter 2 is referring back to chapter 1. What was chapter 1? Jesus is better than uh, the prophets, and Jesus is better than the angels. In Hebrew ideology, uh, both the angels and uh, the prophets had to do with the giving of the law. And so, what he's leading up to, obviously, and he'll spend a lot of time in Hebrews saying that uh, the gospel is greater than the law. But right now, he's establishing, according to Hebrew thinking, the angels had, I mean, the prophets had much to do in the Old Testament at directing the people. They would prophesy the word of the Lord. They didn't prophesy the Ten Commandments. But throughout the economy of law, God spoke to his people through the prophets. And in the giving of the law, the New Testament, there's no uh, indication of this in the Old Testament, actually. But the same in, uh, God who inspired the Old Testament inspired the New. And in the New Testament, it talks about how the angels had their part to play in the giving of the law. And so... Um, he's, again, he, in chapter 1, the first lesson we had in Hebrews, the whole idea was the prophets were important, the prophets were great, but Jesus is greater. The angels were great, but Jesus is greater. So now in verse 1, he's referring back to that. Therefore, because Jesus is greater than those that had something to do with ministry in the Old Covenant, since Jesus is better... Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest we let them slip. Lest we, I was ready to add the word away, but that's not in here. Lest at any time we should let them slip. So the revelation of the gospel has come to us through, uh, we learned in chapter 1, through the manifestation of God's Son, then we ought to give the gospel even a greater earnest heed then the ancestors gave the law. We ought to pay much attention to the gospel. All right, verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast in every transgression and disobedience, received a just recompense of reward. Not reward in the way we think of reward. Uh, we got something good. But reward in the sense you get what uh, got coming to you. Under the law of Moses, when you broke a commandment, uh, you got punishment. And so he said, every transgression and disobedience, disobedience received a just recompense of reward. In other words, you were, re that's not the way you and I use reward in today's, um, we wouldn't call prison, for example, a reward. But uh, in the language of the scripture, that's saying, that's what you got coming because of what you did. And so if that was true of the law, that Every disobedience had a penalty attached to it. Uh, look at Galatians 3.19 underneath there. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hands of a mediator. See, here's the New Testament verse saying the law, the angels had something to do with the giving of the law. So what's he saying here? He's saying the purpose of the law, Paul is writing Galatians, might have written Hebrews, definitely wrote Galatians. And he's saying the intent of the law was not to get you to heaven. 
The intent of the law was to demonstrate to you, you are a sinner. So that when the gospel came onto the scene, you would recognize you needed saved. Now, you and I have never lived in a time when there was no gospel. But up until Jesus came, up until death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to heaven, there was no gospel. The disciples, Peter, John, James, all them guys, uh, they preached what they knew about Jesus. But the gospel as we know it today came into being when God took Paul the Apostle. Oh, well, he, at that time, he was Saul of Tarsus, newly saved. God had knocked him off a donkey, blinded him for a while uh, until he could get his attention. And then he sent a, a preacher to pray, and his eyes were open. And then Barnabas came and befriended him. Barnabas, uh, uh, of high regard of the Jerusalem uh, church, and he came and befriended him. And then Saul disappeared into the desert of Arabia, and God gave Paul the gospel as we understand it today. And uh, so Paul, uh, Paul writes Romans. Wow. Paul writes Galatians. Wow, them are the two greatest books in the New Testament to explain the gospel. And Paul wrote them both. Now, Hebrews is going to really hint at it, and Paul probably wrote Hebrews too. I keep saying things like that because there's dispute over who wrote it. But it's uh, certainly the doctrine of Hebrews, it's Paul. So I always argue, if it wasn't Paul that wrote Hebrews, it was one of the people that worked with them. There was a Aquila and Priscilla. Could have been Aquila. Could have been Luke. Luke traveled with them. He wrote the... Uh, uh, he was more into writing historical books. He wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. But uh, no telling. He could have written this. Um, but somebody who understood the Gospel the way Paul understands it, uh, in my mind, wrote Hebrews. And... Um, so even if Paul didn't write it himself, whoever wrote it, in my mind, was influenced by Paul. So, verse, um, again, after reading uh, chapter 3, verse 19 of Galatians, the purpose of the law was to uh, demonstrate to us we're sinners. He brings that out in great detail to the Jews in the book of Romans. Chapter 2, verse 1, all the way to chapter 3, verse 19. In verses, chapter 1 of Romans, verses 18 to 32, he's patting them on the back. He says, you guys are right. Those non-Jews are a bunch of sinners. And so he's got them all, the, the Jews in the church at Rome. They're all saying, hey man, Paul, you go. And verses 18 to 32 uh, of Romans 1, he said, them guys are sinners. Now he's got the Jewish Christian sitting on the edge of the sea. You tell it, Paul. And then he starts verse 1 with, of chapter 2. Because those Gentiles are sinners, here's what he says, Therefore you are without excuse, whoever judges another. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for you do the very same things. Ouch! There went the amen. <laughs> there went the amen right out the window of the Jewish Christian. And then he takes them on a journey in all of chapter 2 and all the way up to chap uh, verse 17 of chapter 3, showing them, you got the law, big deal, you didn't keep it. The law can't justify you unless you keep it. You thought you're special, you're so special to God because you got the law, but you kept breaking it. And so, he went to great length from verse 18 of chapter 1 to prove the Gentiles were sinners, all the way to chapter 3, verse seven, or 19, rather, to show the Jews that they're sinners. So the whole idea is to show every Christian in Rome, you're a bunch of sinners that need the grace of God in your life. None of you should puff out your chest like you're all that. You are lost sinners. That's what the law is for, to demonstrate that to us. 
All right? That's what uh, Romans 5, uh, the second half of Romans 5 is all about. Verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? That was the reason for the title last week. Uh, we better not neglect the gospel. And in verse 4, God bearing them witness, when they went out and preached the gospel, God worked with the apostles with signs and wonders and miracles. Now let's get on to this week. A little lower than the angels. And the angels are wonderful beings. Those who didn't fall. Those who didn't join in rebellion with Lucifer. The two-thirds of the angels that did not rebel against God are wonderful beings. And God commissioned them to minister to the saints, the Bible says. So these angels minister to us. I think these angels scratch their head because that two-third has never sinned. Now, somebody said once, God created man because he wanted someone that would serve him by choice, not because he could do no other. The angels had to serve him. That's a lie. One-third of the angels rebelled against God. They had choice. But the other two-thirds did not choose to rebel against God. And then they looked down at this group of misfits on earth. And they see God loving on them. And I don't believe the angels are jealous. That'd be a sin. But more of a scratchy head with curiosity. What's going on? How can God love those sinners down there? But He did. And He does. And that's the good news. So, um, now in verse 5 of this week's lesson, he's going to, again, compare the angels to Jesus. For unto the angels has he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. He's saying that this coming world is going to be under the authority of Jesus, not the angels. Remember, again, he's proving that Jesus is greater than the angels here. All right. Now, look down here at Psalm 8, verses 3 to 9. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, this is David writing to God, writing a psalm, which was basically a song, writing a song to God saying, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? David said what the angel thought. I don't get it, God. We're a bunch of misfits. I mean, you spoke all that stuff into existence out there. Why would you give us a second thought? What is man that thou art mindful of him? You are so amazingly great, and we are not. And yet you keep your eye on us at all times. So he goes on in verse 5 of Psalm 8, and said, For thou hast made him, who? Man. Mankind. God has made him... A little lower than the angels, hence the title, a little lower than the angels. God has made man, humankind. Not man versus woman, but mankind. Humans. Look around this little group here. Bunch of disgusting humans we are. All right? So, David, David... You know, David's a lot like this, Dave. He beat himself up a lot, some of his psalms. He beat himself up. He'd sin, and then he'd uh, put it into words, and then before long he had some beautiful psalm. And uh, he recognized his own vanity, his own sin sometimes. And uh, he looked around, and there wasn't anybody else that was any less a sinner than him. So he said, What is man that thou art mindful of him? You made him a little lower than the angels. And yet, though he has made us lower than the angels, David said about us humans, and has crowned him with glory and honor. Mankind. 
Look at verse 6. Thou madest him, humankind, to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. So David is writing, what is man that's so special to you, God? He's not as good as the angels. You made him less than the angels. And yet, this planet here of creatures, you put everything under the dominion of mankind. Verse 7, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beast of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So, David writes, God, I don't get it. I'm glad you like us, but I don't know why you like us. So, you created a planet full of creatures, and you put man there to have dominion over all of them. Okay? Now, Let's get back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6. But one in a certain place testified. Now this is the author of Hebrews referring to the psalm I just read to you. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? And again... The writer of Hebrews says here, because he's quoting from that 8th Psalm, he says here what I read to you. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou uh, crownest him with glory and honor. That's right up there in verse 5 of the Psalm. The writer of Hebrews is quoting the Psalm. And is said, him over the works of thy hands. That's it, this, uh, the writer of Hebrews' way of saying you've given him dominion over all the creatures. And then he says in verse 8, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. If the animals go to war with us, if they could join ranks and all go to war with man, man would win. Never been an animal created a bomb yet. Never been an animal that created a automatic weapon. If the animal started attacking, we'd bring out the big guns and we would show the dominion we have over them. People say dolphins are smarter than people and we skeptics say, yeah, show me a dolphin that built a hospital. Dolphins are pretty intelligent. They're nothing like people. People are created in the image of God. And God gave them dominion over all the creatures on the planet. Now, don't get me wrong. You're in the woods running from a bear. You all by yourself might get eaten by that bear. You remember the old song, a bear was chasing a preacher. He climbed up in a tree and said, Lord, help me. And if you don't help me, please don't help that bear. So, um, animals can kill an individual. They can never win a war against mankind. Mankind has dominion no matter how ferocious the animals are. So, listen to what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Verse 8, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all things under, his, under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not all things put under him. So now after quoting the psalm, he said, you put everything under subjection to man, but man's having trouble with stuff. Even though you put things under the subjection of mankind, he's not handling that authority well at all. One of these days... You might destroy large parts of the planet, who knows, uh, with nuclear war or whatever. So he's not handling it. So what is David talking about down there in the bottom? And, and co- consequently, what is the author of Hebrews talking about? David and the writer of Hebrews were both 
talking about a man or a human. Now, turn it over. What does David say about mankind? Man is too insignificant to imagine that God would think about him, let alone visit him. Verse 6. God created, and that's it, of Psalm 8. God created man a little lower than the angels. God crowned man with glory and honor. God set man over his creation. God put everything in his creation subject to man under man's feet. God left nothing that is not put under man's authority. Now, what does the author of Hebrews attach to this quote from Psalm 8? So far, we haven't seen man walk in this authority God has given him over creation. So what is man? God, you've made him just a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. Made all creation subject to him, yet we don't see all creation subject to him. Certainly, one area we can think about if we get our mind off animals storms. We have hurricanes just hitting land like crazy sometimes. We have hurricane seasons that are just crazy bad. We have wildfires all over the country. I mean, there are things we are not controlling with all of our science. We are not subjecting the world to ourselves. All right. Now look at verse 9. I want you, I want to flip that back over. Before I read verse 9, I want to uh, reread verse 8 at the bottom of uh, the other side. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all things under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not all things put under him. Theoretically, God put everything under the control of man, but man's not controlling everything. So he ends verse 8 by saying, He gave man all this authority, yet we look around and we don't see man ruin everything. But look at how verse 9 starts on the other side. But we see Jesus. We don't see any man ruin everything, but we see Jesus. Amen? Now, listen to how that verse goes on. Who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. What did he say about mankind in Psalm 8 and on the other side of this in Hebrews? He said, God made man a little lower than the angels. Now, what does it say about Jesus? God made him a little lower than the angels, that he might suffer death. What does it mean if man is made a little lower than the angels, and all of a sudden Jesus is made a little lower than the angels? What it means is that God sent Jesus here to be a human. This God who sat on a throne forever and ruled over everything and had no difficulty controlling anything. Jesus. God wrapped him in a human body. Didn't start that way. This Jesus that according to Scripture holds everything together. You see this big universe out here? You don't see it from in here, but you know when you go outside on a clear night, yeah. this universe is amazing. Yeah, amazing. They talked about some star 32,000 light years away. You know what that means? They, they picked up uh, flashes of light. I don't know if that means it's uh, burning out or what. But this star... 32,000 light years away means if you could build a spaceship that would travel 186,000 miles a second, it would take it 32,000 years to get to that star. I tell you, you might leave young, but you're coming back old. <laughs> That's a long way away. That's a big God. And Jesus holds everything together. With the words of his mouth, the Bible teaches. 
Now, I don't know. In the kenosis, that's a, that's a um, commentator word describing what happened in Philippians 2 when Jesus thought it not robbery. a matter of fact, well, let's drop down to it since I brought it up. Philippians 2, verses 6 to 11 down below. Talking about Jesus. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. I want you to let that soak in. Jesus is God. And as God, He was in every way equal to God. In the Greek, that expression, he thought not equality with God was something to be grasped. You know what that's saying? He didn't wrap his arms around it and said, equality with God is mine. I will not surrender it. But he submitted to being made a little lower than the angels, like you. And he submitted coming into this world the way you came into this world. Spent the first nine months of his journey down on earth in a woman's womb. God did that. God did that. This is why it amazes me. Here's the Son of God. You got Lucifer. I call it the Lucifer complex. He wasn't God. He was cast out of heaven because he wanted to be like God. He rebelled against God. So here's the devil who's not God, who falls because he insists on being God. That's the Lucifer principle. And then you got Jesus who was God, but in, didn't insist on clinging to it with all of his might. That's the Jesus principle. That's why I can't believe it when Christians come to a church, see some visitors sitting in their pew. <laughs> Instead of rejoicing inwardly, we got a visitor. They're thinking, how do I get them out of my pew? <laughs> you know why? They think that pew is something to be grasped. That pew is not your pew. I don't care if you donated money and they use the money you donated to buy that pew. Once it's set in the sanctuary, it isn't your pew anymore. So, I didn't say anything. Yeah. Well, you can't, again, it's not your. It's not my seat. And the thing that I want to stress to people Jesus was. And is, never quit being God. But he didn't think that man he had to hold on to everything he had in heaven. But he willingly submitted to the will of the Father and entered humanity nine months in the womb of a mother. Now I'm going to tell you something. When a woman gets pregnant, that baby doesn't know anything but that womb. In Mary's case, that baby was God and knew everything about everything. What I wonder if while that baby that was in the womb of Mary, if it was still holding everything in the universe together with its word. Because he never quit being God. Scripture doesn't talk about stuff like that until we don't know. But uh, he was always God Theology teaches this. He was a hundred percent man and a hundred percent God. He wasn't fifty fifty. He wasn't half God and half man. He was the miracle man. He was all God and all man. So he submitted to entering the world. I tell you, pregnancy is a happy time for most couples. It seems in America today, People either rejoice when they get pregnant or look for someone to kill it. Them seem to be the two options anymore. Kill the thing, get it out of me. Uh, we're going to have children. 
and especially if you're Lexi, not child, children. <laughs> but anyway, uh, for centuries, most women were happy when they got pregnant. But now we're taught, they're taught in universities and everywhere. You, you don't have to, just because you get pregnant, you don't have to have the baby. That's your body. But anyway, I don't want to digress into that because that drives me crazy. The 21st century, no woman needs to get pregnant that doesn't want a baby. Period. No woman. So, if you don't want to have a baby, I got news for you. Don't get pregnant. Now, about the only woman who ever got pregnant without any con well, even she had consent, was Mary. The, de uh, the angel, Gabriel, didn't ask her permission. Told her what was going to happen. But even though the angel wasn't asking Mary, Mary said, be it unto your hand, maiden, as you have said. So Mary was just, I'm sure she had no clue what was about to happen because it ain't ever happened before. But uh, she knew that was an angel and she knew that was a message from God. So understand it or not, she said, have your way with me, God. But Jesus entered it, mankind, all right? So now, being very in... In very nature, again, Philippians 2, 6, God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. God made himself nothing. Let that sink in. God, John wrote in John 1, there wasn't anything made that wasn't made by him. Talking about Jesus. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit all had a part in creation. And there wasn't anything created without God the Father. There wasn't anything that was made, made without God the Spirit. And John said, there isn't anything made that wasn't made without God the Son, Jesus. He is Almighty God. He made in retrospect to who He was. And He still... It, it's so hard to word these things because he never quit being this. It wasn't like he gave up being God when he came here. He was always God. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, servant being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that is the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the Jesus principle. Now, verse 8 on the other side, God gave man authority over everything, but the psalmist writes, but we don't see that authority. But verse 9 said, But we see Jesus. He was made like one of us, a little lower than the angels. Like us, He was crowned with glory and honor. And the reason God did that was so by the grace of God, He should taste death for every man. If there was no stable, there'd be no cross. If there was no stable... No one paid that awful cost. If there was no stable, then all would be lost. For if there was no stable, there'd be no cross. It had to start with nine months in a woman's uh, body. Without that, you and I are still in our sins, waiting to die and go to hell forever if it hasn't been for Jesus. So we don't see man having authority over everything. But the writer of Hebrews said, but we see a certain man, not mankind, but a certain man with complete authority, and that man is Jesus. Now, 
What did Jesus, why did Jesus become a little lower than the angels? Uh, and the answer, he did it so by the grace of God he could taste death for every man. He had to become man to die for you and die for me. And then I showed you the last part of verse 8, and we've been talking about the first part of verse 9. But now we see not yet all things under him, under man, but we see Jesus. So, what do we learn from the above passage on Philippians 2? Believing the earth was round. See, I told you. I had to Google stuff today because uh, I've seen something here. I had it wrong. I thought Columbus sailed east to get west. So I Googled and it said, uh, no, no, no. Google didn't really tell me no, no, no. But it just pointed me to the truth. He sailed west. To get east. So here was Columbus, who even though a lot of the world, uh, people, scientists of that day thought the earth was flat, and that if you sailed a ship far enough, you'd fall off the edge. Columbus didn't believe that, and he believed you could get east by heading west. Now why did I put that there? I want you to see a parallel. Believing the earth was round... Columbus sailed west to reach the east. Knowing that man needed salvation, Jesus stepped down to go up. He didn't cling to who he was as God. He humbled himself and became man. A huge step down. The Creator became part of creation. Most creators live outside of what they create. All creators except God. But through Jesus, the Creator became part of creation. That is a giant step down. And what does the... What happened... With the Jesus principle. Lucifer wanted to raise his throne above God's. So God flung him to earth. Jesus, though he was God, was willing to go down to earth. And so what was the result? Back to Philippians 2. Verse 9, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And I'm going to tell you something, the highest place means the highest place there. Right now, until this whole thing is wrapped up, until the last enemy is put under uh, God's feet, which is death, under the feet of Jesus, actually. All things are under his feet. God said about man, but we don't see that, but we see Jesus. And the last enemy he will conquer is death. He will chase death away from humankind forever. Now when he does that, things are going to change. But right now the Bible teaches that it pleases the Father that all preeminence dwell in Jesus. We Christians talk more about Jesus than anyone. We talk more about Jesus than we do God the Father. We talk about Jesus more than we talk about God the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it pleases the Father that He ought to be the preeminent ones in our life, the one in our life. When the last enemy is underfoot, when everything is wrapped up, at least a thousand seven years from now, you've got to get through the tribulation, got to get through the millennial reign of Christ. So it's at least one thousand seven years from now. But when dying dies, that's kind of a neat phrase. uh, phrase. When dying dies and there is no more death, then 1 Corinthians 15 teaches it will all go back to God and His people. But until now, Jesus has a name that's even above His Father, higher in the sense that it pleases the Father that He be the preeminent one. And that will end one day. But right now, 
because he came down. He didn't cling to who he was, grab onto it and say, I won't let go. But he humbled himself, lowered himself all the way down to earth, became man, died for our sin, because he did everything the Father asked and redeemed all who would come to him. Father has glorified Him in a new way, given Him a name that's above every name, never been a name exalted like the name of Jesus. Not even Donald Trump. Donald Trump's always saying, no one's ever seen anything like this before. (laughs) I tell you, no one's ever seen anything like this before. God became man, and because the Father rewarded Him for it, He is highly exalted, Give him a name above all names. Now, what's the end result of that as we close? That at his name, on Judgment Day, sinner or saint, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess in the name of Jesus. Doesn't matter if you're a sinner on the way to hell. If you're a sinner who lived your entire life as an atheist, Before your sentence, the words are going to come out of your mouth. Jesus is Lord. Because God has decreed it and ordained it. Not only are those words going to come out of the mouth of every sinner, but without any choice on their part, they're going to kneel before Him when they say it. Why? Because God has highly exalted His name and nothing else could possibly happen.